saying we're in a, a series, a campaign right now. I've tried not to really call it a, a campaign, uh, but it's called Heart for the House. And the idea behind this is that we, th- this house here, that's us, and then full of us people, that we, we are the heart here. Uh, a while ago, I started praying and asking God, God, are we going to uh, stay where we are or are we going to expand? Now, I put that in his hands. And if he had said, hey, I want you to stay right where you are, I'd say, okay, you know, great, Lord. What, what should we learn from this? Uh, obviously, there's a reason for us to do that. You know, you want us to, to grow in some areas. Um, so my heart is always that we grow and that we expand. Uh, but I'm also quite content when God says, hey, Chris, just chill out. Like, I got stuff that I'm doing with, with, uh, with what you have right now. But God said, Chris, I'm going to expand you. And when we prayed and asked God, what did that look like? Uh, God said, I want you guys to pay the debt off. Uh, for those of you that haven't been around, uh, and for those of you that have, I'm sorry, you're just going to hear this again. Uh, but a good portion of our tithe income goes straight, to, uh, goes straight to the debt of the building. And I'm thankful for this building. This building's amazing that we have this building. It really is incredible. It allows us to do amazing things, not only on Sunday mornings, but during the week when we're able to rent the space out for people. I mean, it's just a great, amazing thing to have. But a good portion of our tithe goes to that. And we would like our tithe to go uh, more towards ministry, more towards salaries, being able to hire more people, uh, things that will allow us to do kingdom building, um, out there in the community to take what God's doing in here and do it out there. And so at the end of the month, not if, not hopefully, uh, not when, but at, at the end of the month, we're going to be able to pay off all of our debt, which is 2.55 uh, million rand. Like how I said that, we're going to pay this off. Yeah. You know, if you had a pastor that was like, I'm really hoping that you got, you know, that'd be a bad pastor there. So we're going to pay this off. I just want to highlight uh, that number two is a small number, right? You know, it could be ten, but it's, it's, it's two. It's only one bigger than one. So th- this number here, yeah, it's astronomical. It, it, it is huge. You know, I make jokes about it. Um, but when, with this gone, that frees up 82,000 rand a month. Not once, not twice. But every single month, that frees up 82,000 rand that gets spread out and helps us to do a lot of things. I'll give you uh, two kind of thing, two teasers, two tasters. Uh, one of the things that we would love to do is we'd love to be able to hire somebody that specializes in dealing with kids with special needs. And we have a vision here at this church that every single family ministry environment has somebody that's in there that is trained to deal with special needs. And this matters to us. Uh, because we have been given uh, a, a lot of kids like this. And we believe, I believe deeply, deeply, deeply that every child should have the same opportunity to have an encounter with Jesus on a Sunday morning. And I, 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 I'm not saying that they don't have that now, but I'm saying that we could do something a whole lot better. We could do something a lot more to help those, those children. And that comes when this is paid off and that 82K is freed up. All of a sudden, we've got the ability to do things like that. We've got the ability. That, that, that's just one example for you. So this, to me, to you guys, I, I, I know we're going to pay this off at the end of the month, but I don't know how. You know, I, I, I don't know uh, how God's going to bring that in. It's not my job to know how. In fact, I don't ever want what we do to start becoming explainable. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be horrible? If we could explain everything that happens here, you know, I, I think that there's such a beauty and such a, a wonderful thing in the unexplainable. You know, how, how is it that we are, I mean, when I look out here and I see you guys, I'm constantly like shocked that you guys just keep showing up. You know, you, you just keep coming. Every Sunday, and it's, I mean, it's incredible, it's unexplainable. You know, the fact that last year we paid off a million rand of debt, you know, on our own is unexplainable. The fact that the tithe continues to grow is unexplainable. The fact that people come to Jesus, and they give their hearts to Jesus, and they join small groups, and they get baptized, and all of that stuff to me is unexplainable. 
It's, it's just, it, and I don't ever want what we do to become explainable because I, I, I want the mystery and the wonder of God working to always be the thing in our church that accomplishes and that drives us forward. I, I want us to be known for being the church of the unexplainable. And the way that we do that, the thing that ushers in this unexplainable thing that God does in our church and in our congregation here is, I've been saying this all month, we do what God says and we see what he does. So I, I've spent the last couple of weeks, and, and I, I just want you to know, anytime a church does like a, a fundraising campaign or they call it a capital campaign, what they say, that their strategy to how to, to how to do this. And I've not really followed any of that strategy. I, I've spent the first two weeks doing nothing but asking you to ask God what this would cost of you or, or how you can give towards this or how you can be a part of this, because it's the most important thing for me is that you hear from God and you respond to God. That's the most important thing. I, I want to celebrate at the end of this month when we pay this thing off. I, 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 yeah, we'll celebrate being debt free and that, that'll be amazing. But what I really want to celebrate is that we are an obedient and a generous church. Because if we catch that in this and watch what happens... Well, watch what happens when all of us, we hear from God, we do what he says, and we see what he does. When we do what he says, and when we see what he does, and we, we, we capture, we see that miracle, we see our, our debt paid for, we, we see what happens when we're obedient and when we're generous, and that's just going to build more and more momentum. I mean, just imagine the opportunity that we have when we have a congregation that is on fire for seeing what God does. That's what, that's what we celebrate here. That's actually what I'm the most after. To me, that's the biggest priority. That's why in two weeks, I have, we've not even given you like a, a giving code. You know, pe pe our, our finance team has been like, Chris, you need to give you know, a giving code. And I'm like, well, I, I, I will. But in, in week three, because the first two weeks... The, those are for you guys to hear from God. Now, I, I want to bring in a verse from James here because, again, it's to do what God says and see what he does. So I want to talk about that word do here. So in James 1.22, I love the book of James, by the way. It's great. It's like a, like a how-to for life. Um, it's a really great book in the Bible. If you've never read it, you know, just jump into it and, uh, and take a read on it. But and in, in verse 22, James is talking here and he says, But prove yourself doers of the word actively and continually obeying God's precepts. Now, let me pause right there. It, it doesn't say improve yourselves doers of the word by giving money to South Point Church's capital campaign to try and pay off their debt. What, what it said, I don't want to use this to manipulate you. I, I refuse. That's why I preach out of the Amplified Bible because you can't manipulate the, the, the text here. These little brackets tell you what this actually means here. And so by doing the word, what James is saying, what it's talking about is actively and continually obeying God's precepts. Obey what God tells you. Obey uh, the rule of God's love. Love God, love your neighbor. O obey the commandments. Obey the sovereignty of God. Obey God's word. That, that's the doing part. And I believe that if we do those parts, then the unexplainable happens. And the miracles happen, and things come, and amazing things happen in here, and salvations happen, and, and, and all of that stuff comes, but it comes from doing, and that doing, that's you in your prayer closet. That's you at home in front of your Bible. That's you in the car listening to worship music and hearing God, you know, put somebody in your heart to show a little bit of extra love to, and, and then you do that. You send that message, or you call that person. That's the doing that we're talking about here. I'd rather promote this doing than the doing of giving the church money because if you do this, then the rest of it's taken care of. And at the end of the month, we just we write the check, we're over, we're done. Because you're doing what God is asking you to do. And what God's asking you to do is enter into a relationship of generosity and obedience with Him. And then He goes on to say, and, and, and it's not merely listeners. And what he means by a listener here is who hear the word but fail to internalize its meaning. Parents, that's kind of like your kids at school, right? They, they, they listen to what the teacher says, but they don't internalize 
you know, the meaning, the meaning of what they're talking about. You ever ask your kid, you guys awake? You ever ask your kids, hey, what'd you learn today? And they're like, well, I don't know. You know, and you're like, you were at school all day today. You, you can't tell me what you, you know, what you learned? It's like, eh, you know, you kind of give you grunts, you know, instead of words. So that, 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 that's kind of what it's talking about here. Don't be that way with God's word. You know, don't hear the words and not internalize the meaning. So, the, you know, the way you do that is you, you hear God. And then when you hear God, maybe it's here, maybe it's through worship in your quiet time, maybe through an interaction with somebody else. Don't just let the words pass through. So you just maybe pause for a second. I wonder what this means here. I wonder what this could mean. Or God, I don't understand this at all. Can you break this down for me and help me out here? But James is talking about being a doer more than just a listener. And then he goes on to say, uh, and not merely listeners who hear the word but fail to internalize its meaning, deluding yourselves by unsound reasoning contrary to the truth. So what happens when you don't internalize God's word when you don't listen and do what God says you end up guided by things that are contrary to God's truth and so again my heart and we've talked about this for two weeks yes I can present the need and present the vision for what we want to do but my heart is that you hear God my heart is that you learn to go to God And my heart is that as you hear God, you do what God says and you see what God does. And so today, it's the first Sunday that I'm kind of calling uh, Commitment Sunday. And what I want you to do with this commitment is is this. When you leave today, uh, you're going to be given like a kind of a special gift as you walk out the door. Um, And in fact, I'll go ahead and tell you now, I saved this to the end. Um, in, the, uh, in the first service. But when you walk out the door, and if you leave early, you don't get the gift, okay? When you walk out the door, you're going to be given like a, a, a little envelope right here. And inside this envelope, mine's empty, but inside this envelope is going to be a sum of money. And it may be 20 rand, it may be 300 rand, uh, it may be 10,000. No, it's not 10,000 rand. You can't, you can't, <laughs> yeah. Nobody, the first service, people were feeling like how heavy it was. No, I'm kidding. But you're going to be given an envelope here, and it's going to have a couple things that we've been saying in the service here. And what I want you to do is make a commitment that when you take this envelope and the cash that's inside, you're making a commitment to ask God what he would have you do with this, to be a blessing to somebody. I want you to ask God. And if you don't hear from God, or you struggle to hear from God, then don't do anything with it yet. You know, pack it away in the car, put it in a pocket, because there will come a time or be a situation where you'll be out, you'll be at the petrol station, and God will say, hey, give that to that guy right there, the, the, the pump attendant. And whatever it ends up being, the commitment that I'm asking you to make is to ask God and then do what God says. And then also today, before you open this, before you see the money that's inside, I really want to encourage you, also in line with making a commitment, with this being Commitment Sunday, is to say, God, what would you have me do for Heart for the House? And then that number that God gives you, that thing that God tells you to do, I want you to say, God, I'm committing to you to do that. So you're not committing to me. You're not committing to South Point Church. That's, that, that doesn't mean anything. You're committing to God. It's between you and it's between God. And now for the first Sunday, I want to give you guys the reference code here. If you are going to give, and you are uh, giving through an EFT or something, you can put H4TH, which means heart for the house, uh, so that we know how to allocate that. We know where that goes to. You know, at the end of this month, when we write the, the check and we get debt free, I just can't wait to celebrate the obedience and the generosity here. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about this debt here. I want to ask you a couple questions. Uh, if you buy a house, and when you buy the house, it rains. And when it rains, you realize or you see that the roof is leaking. 
All right, a couple things. One, that's every house in Cape Town, right? Yeah, see, yeah, you just, uh, you know. But, but when that house is leaking, when that roof is leaking, if it's bad enough, you don't say, I'm not fixing that roof because I'm not the reason that it started to leak. The person that owned it before is why it started to leak. So I'm, I'm not going to fix that. That's not my deal. It's not my problem. Or let me give you another example here. Let's say you enter into a relationship with somebody and you're in that like that really cool like honeymoon phase. You know, my, my wife and I just celebrated uh, nine years as our, as our wedding anniversary. Can you believe that she stuck with me for nine years? I know. I know. I know. Feels like a thousand, but... No, she's, she's amazing. But could you imagine in, in that honeymoon phase when you're first dating somebody, you're first getting to know them, everything's perfect and wonderful, and how could anything be wrong with them, right? And then when you get to know them a little bit more, you progress in the relationship, you realize that they're messed up, and they're as messed up as you are, and that they've got problems. Yeah, somebody's sitting next to somebody like, yeah, you know. <laughs> Yeah, so people are messed up people. But you don't look at that person and say, you know what, you've got issues, but that's not my problem. I, I don't have to deal with your issues. Somebody else hurt you. Somebody else bothered you. It's not mine to deal with. Deal with it yourself. You don't do that with a house. You don't do that with a person. You know, and our, our, our debt, this thing that God's put on our heart, is the same way. You know, it may not be your debt. You may not have been a part of the decision to buy the building or to move in here or to whatever it is. You may not have been a part of that. It may not be your debt, but it is an opportunity for a new legacy. And I want to talk a little bit about legacy because I believe that that is the thing that we get the chance, the opportunity to leave behind. So a legacy can build a reputation that goes before us, but I believe that, that the strength in a legacy is what we actually leave behind. And, and, and when it comes to building a legacy, think about that house or think about the, that relationship example I was, I was talking to you about. What you inherit, so the thing that you inherit is not as important as what you leave behind. Do it, can, can we understand that? You know, the thing that we inherit is not as important as what we leave behind because we leave behind a legacy. You know, you don't leave behind a leaky roof or a broken person. You leave behind a fixed roof. You leave behind a fixed and a loved person. So what we as a church leave behind as we move on, as we hand this thing over to another generation one day, that's the legacy. You know, another way to put this is that which is behind you will be seen as a reflection of you. You know, that... That there's a, let's say, let's go back to the house example. You move into the house that's got the leaky roof. Well, that's not my leaky roof. That's not my legacy. But after you've been there for a year, for two years or whatever, if the roof is still leaking, if the moles have destroyed the yard and you've not done anything about it, and if you stop taking the trash out and, you know, you let that roof continue to leak and part of it falls in, so you just put a, a tarp over the top. You know, it's now it's not the person that you got the house from. Now it's a, that house is a product of you. And I'm not, let me just get this straight. I'm not talking about the elderly or people falling on hard times. That, that's not what I mean by this here. But now that house becomes a legacy or a representation of you. What you leave behind will be seen as a reflection of you. You know what I would love to leave behind here at this church? I would love to leave behind a legacy of salvation, a legacy of baptisms. I would love to leave behind a legacy of people coming in here and it being a safe environment, a family to call their own, you know, a church to call home. I would love that legacy to include us being able to leave behind a debt-free church that just changes the way that churches are done, in, especially in our area here where the church stays debt-free. The next generation picks it up and they don't have that weight hanging over them and they're able to dream and then do. I, I want to leave behind a legacy of a church, of a congregation, of you guys that capture the vision, that capture the power, that capture the, 
the wonder and the unexplainableness of hearing God, doing what God says, and then seeing what God is going to do. I, I want to look back and say that this is one of the defining seasons where we got that and we picked that up. And it's going to define the season moving forward. Again, it's, it's not about you giving us money so that we pay the debt off. It's about you and God. It's about you hearing God. It's about you talking to God. It's about you making a commitment to God. That's where we celebrate obedience. That's where we celebrate generosity. And when you do that, the reflection that's, that's left behind is this legacy of who we are as a church. And the legacy isn't a church that raises 2.5 million rand in a month. The legacy is we're a church that believes in the unexplainable. Because we put our faith in God and we do what God says and we see what God does. Now, the way that we're going to do this here, I only got to preach about half of it last week, uh, is we do this through a, a, a term called stewardship. And what stewardship is, is stewardship is that, that there's a provision or something given to you, provided to you, and then you are taking that and you are dispersing it, you are, are, are spread, so it comes through you and it flows out. And while you hold it, you're taking care of it, you're managing it well, but it's coming through and it's going out. So we try and steward your tithe. So when you tithe to us, we take 10% of that tithe and we put it in a separate fund called South Point Cares. And we don't use that fund for anything except to give to widows and orphans and other nonprofit organizations and care for our own members when they're you know, hard and down on luck. But that's where that goes. It doesn't go anywhere else, just to that. And that's the way that we steward the tithe. We take the tithe in, we take 10%, and we give that out. That's just one example of that. See, th this is the way that God works with stewardship. God blesses us. God blesses us so that we can distribute God's things, not our things. See, when God blesses you, it doesn't become yours. You know, the, the money in your bank account, none of that's actually yours. The clothes on your body, none of that's actually yours. You know, the favor that you have at, at work, none of that's actually yours. When, when God blesses you, it doesn't become yours. That, that's when stewardship becomes management. Okay, now I'm going to collect and take all this provision. I'm going to manage this myself. I'm going to keep it to myself. It, it doesn't become yours. Instead, God says, I want you to distribute God's things, not your things, on God's behalf, not on your behalf, with God's purposes, not your purposes. And then what happens as we steward that, God gives us more and more provision. And there's something so, uh, so cool about God's provision and about when we get the idea that we steward it, that we send that out, that we take it, we don't hold on to it, make it ours, but we share it and we disperse it. And when we do that, we can then see these, these encounters that happen and, and it's my provision, your provision. Look how amazing this is here. This is truth. My provision stewarded can be someone else's prayer answered. Can you imagine that? It, it, wouldn't that just be amazing? You know, and a lot of those prayers we'll never know about. We'll never know all the prayers that are answered. But what God gives to you, He wants you to steward for His purpose on His behalf. And God uses that. You know, there's someone out there that's got a prayer, and your provision is the answer to it. And it may not be just money. It may be your provision of love. It may be your pr provision of time. It may be your provision of, uh, of, of, a, of just like a, a visit at home. It's not just finances. What has God given you? He's given you talents. It may be your provision of your talent that you send out, that you steward and you put out. And, and that's the answered prayer. That, I, I want to continue to emphasize this. Yes, we're talking about money. We're talking about debt, finances. And yes, there is that aspect to it. But remember, the most important thing for you to get today is this is about you and God. About you asking God what He would have you do. About you doing what God says and seeing what God does. And that may start with God telling you 
to go and love that person, to go show that person patience, to go ask that person for forgiveness. Do what God says and see what God does. Because see, God forgave you. He loved you. Let that flow through, steward that, and give that out. You know, unfortunately, we don't really have... You have the option whether or not you want to steward God's provision. But you don't have the option of accounting for it. So let me speak to all the Christ followers in here. If you don't believe in Jesus, if you're not a Christ follower, you can just sit back and relax here. But if you are a Christ follower, if Jesus is your Lord, you cannot escape the responsibility that you have to account for the provision that God has given you. So the responsibility of the steward is to give an account to those who own the provision of the steward. I want to quickly run through um, a a story in the Bible. We're only going to hit the parts of the account. See, in Matthew 25, this is the the story of uh, the master going away. When he goes away, he's got these three servants, and he gives each of them a portion of money. One he gives five, one he gives two, and then one he he gives to, to one. And when he returns, they have to account for it. And so if we look at verse 20, this is the first, the first guy. And the one who had received the five talents came and brought him five more, saying, Master, you entrusted to me five talents. See, I have made a profit and gained five more talents. So he had to account for that. The guy number two says, Also, the one who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I'm accounting for this. See, I've made a profit and gained two more talents. Now, the third guy, not so favorable here. The one who had received one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a harsh and demanding man, reaping the harvest where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. And in verse 25, so I was afraid to lose the talent, and I went and hid your talent in the ground, and see, you have what is your own. Now, one of the things that I take from this here is that God does not want you to hold on and hide the provision and then give it back to him. God wants you to take it and use it and steward it out. God doesn't give you talent, money. uh, He doesn't give you time. He doesn't give you patience. He doesn't give you love. So you can bury it in the ground and then one day give it back to him. God says use it. Invest it. Make a difference with it. So why would God, this is important here, so why would God give us provision to steward? Now, God doesn't need us. Let let me just break the news to you guys. God doesn't actually need you. He he doesn't need me up here to preach to you. If God wanted to to give this TV a mouth and make it talk to you, he he could do that. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need us. So if God doesn't need us and he doesn't need me, why would God provide provision in order for us to steward? And and that's a big question. It comes down to a lot about God wants us to have the choice to choose him. He wants us to have, you know, we were given choice. We were given that free will. But here's a verse that I really like that explains it in a really simple, easy to grasp way. One reason why God does this in 2 Corinthians 9, you will be enriched in every way so that. So what this means here is you will be enriched. So God will give you provision in every way. But then these two words, so that, provide the purpose. This is the why. And so it's so that you may be generous. So God provides provision so that you may be generous and this generosity administered, meaning you got to send it and you got to use it. And through us, it's producing thanksgiving to God from those who benefit. That's why God does it. God wants a people that are generous. He wants a people that administer what he's provided so that you steward and you administer it. He wants a church that does that. See, God doesn't want to bring his generosity, his justice, his healing, his provision outside of the church. And by the church, I don't mean the building, I mean us, us people in here. But instead, he wants to do that 
through the church. He wants to do that through you. That, that again, is why I spent the first two weeks just driving home the idea, the concept, the ask that you hear from God. Because God wants to do all of this through you. He doesn't want to do all this through the building. God wants to do it through you, through the church. And I need you. I want you. I desire. I crave for you to have a relationship with God. And it doesn't have to be a deep, long-standing spiritual relationship. But to have a relationship with God where you say, God, what would you have me do? with what you've provisioned for me, with what you've provided for me, what would you have me to do? And then God to speak to you and say, hey, go love that person. Go call that person. Hey, go financially help that person. And, and, and then when you hear that, you do it, and then you see what God does. Because seeing what God does is when you usher in the unexplainable. So when you start doing what God says, you start to see what you can't explain which is God's miracles. And God's desire is to do that through you. See, if that's God's desire, then that means that it'll happen. Guys, I'm inviting you into this. I'm inviting you to see what God does when you do what God says. You can't outgive God. You can't outbless God. You can't outlove God. See, what's on the other side of this here, what's on the other side of this phrase that I keep using uh, to, to, to do what God does and see what he says. What's on the other side of that is this incredible miracle. These incredible miracles, these incredible blessings, these incredible healings, these incredible provisions. What's on the other side of that is the unexplainable of God. The unexplainable that only God can do. Do we want to be a church that leaves a legacy of God doing unexplainable things. Well, if we do, it's on the other side of doing what God says and seeing what God does because He wants to do that through us. And so today, once more, we're, we're, we're going to have the opportunity today to practice the process of generosity through stewardship. And that's why you're getting this envelope right here so that you can practice that process. But that's also why I'm asking you to make a commitment to God, not to me, not to this church. Make a commitment to God. God, tell me what I should do for heart for the house. And then when he tells you, do it and see what God says. And I want you to do the same thing with this envelope, with this money. God, tell me what to do with what's in this envelope. And then do it and see what God does. And just imagine what he will do with the little that's in here. And he, he'll do so much more with when you go to him and say, God, what, what should I do with heart for the house? God's got such a desire for us to learn these things here. Uh, Paul's got a verse in Corinthians here that he talks in, in 2 Corinthians verse 7 here. And he says, let each one give thoughtfully and with purpose. He's talking to the church because he was fundraising for the church, by the way. So Paul's giving a sermon on money here. So he says, let each one give thoughtfully with purpose just as he has decided in his heart because it's in your hearts between you and God. All right? Not grudgingly or under compulsion. If you feel like, like it's a, like a condemnation or like you're compelled to do it by somebody outside of God, don't do it. And Paul's saying, don't do it if it's grudgingly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver, and he delights in the one whose heart is in his gift. That's, that's, what, God want, uh, that's what God wants for us. And so what, what I'm going to do is um, we're going to close out the service here. This, that, that's what I've got for you guys today. And when you walk out of this room, at the door there, you're going to get an envelope. You can only take one. Okay? <laughs> one. This is not unlimited here. And this isn't church money either, by the way. The money that's in here is money from somebody that heard what God said, and and he did it. Do what God says and see what God does. He came, and he said, I want to do this. And so when you walk out, grab this. Put it in your pocket. Put it somewhere. But ask God what you should do with this, and then do it.
Let's bow our head and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would call everybody to you that needs to hear from you. I pray, Father, that you would speak so clearly that when people walk out and grab an envelope, you just, you just tell them exactly what to do with it. And as people consider and start making a commitment for heart for the house, I pray, Father, that you would speak to them as well and that they would hear it. God, this whole thing is about us as a church hearing you, doing what you say, and watching what you do. So, Lord, I, I pray for that. I pray for everybody in this room. In Jesus' name, amen.